Okay, fish scales happen. You know, the whole thing is that we get these fishes that go crosses on the eyes, and and this is, can be done by the uh, being a, having a wormy life. You know, there's all sorts of little critters that live in uh, in fish, and a lot of times they have don't do any harm to the fish, but there's times that uh, they are a situation and we can end up with massive fish kills. Uh, and why we have, why do we have uh, fish kills? Well, we do have uh, uh, parasites. Can we see a little laser pointer now? Yes. 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 Okay, yes. right. Yes. Uh, we we always have a hose. In this case, we got a catfish. We have an aquatic environment it lives in and a, a, and a pathogen out there. You know, we got environment, host. We got three components to, a, to the fish health model. And you've got to have all three. But just because you got the environment and pathogens and hosts, doesn't mean that we have a disease. We have to force these components together to cause a disease problem that results in a very sick fish. So something happens. What drives drives this model together where we have a pathogen host merging is the environment stresses out the fish and merges it to a situation where the pathogen can infect the fish and cause a massive mortality. Here we got poor uh, environment and a lot of fish that's died because you weren't checking the water quality, oxygen levels, the fish got stressed out, pathogens jumped on the fish, resulting in a disease, and it was zootic that causes a massive fish kill. Okay, again, the situation is that, you know, we want to keep these pathogens out. It's always a good idea to have some kind of plan, some kind of biosecurity plan, because you don't want to be raising fish, keeping the bugs out. You know, we have the good old uh, bed bugs, bird mites, the fleas, and the ticks. They're not on the fish. But we have bugs that are on the fish. Let's find out. Okay, wormy life. Here we have a, a typical perch type fish and all the different critters that we can have. We got the protozoans, the nematodes, the larval digenes, the cotopods, the monogenetic trematodes, the crony worms, the digenes, the leeches. You know, uh, again, it's a it's a it's pretty much a wormy life, and they occupy different parts of the fish. You notice a lot of the protozoans are in the gills, a lot of the uh, digenes and thorny worms are in the intestinal tract, some things are on the outside, the grubs are found in the muscle, the visceral organs, the nematodes can be found throughout the fish, uh, and everything else. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, little human here. Uh, uh, your fish are going to be okay. It's only a simple procedure. But we do have cleaner fish out there. Protozoans, let's talk about them. Uh, these are a group of, uh, of organisms that can be found on uh, fish. Uh, they are various different kinds. Probably one that you probably might have heard of a lot if you're interested in trout is uh, whirling disease. Here we got a, a young crinoline. A uh, trout, you notice the tail is a little black uh, because the whirling disease that's protozoan that affects the nervous system of the trout it gets in the brain and causes uh, neurological damage that causes the fish to uh, create pigment in the tail, uh, curvature of the spine, and erratic swimming behavior. Let's look at it again. Uh, the host is uh, the definitive host for whirling disease is the is the uh, uh, some type of some like a rainbow trout. 
It's a produced by Mixoblis cerebellus. It's a little uh, protozoan type organism. It's really not a protozoan. It's a uh, more related to jellyfish uh, on this. Uh, they have an own phylum now. They're not even related, but we still kind of relate these back to uh, to protozoans. So we have these spores that are producing the fish. Uh, the fish dies. They're released. They can be picked up by birds and spread around. And there's a complicated life cycle in this. And for many, many years, we didn't realize that uh, how complex this life cycle was. Uh, they end up in some kind of tuberific worm, and they develop into a trigonixon, which uh, has these three elongated things on there that sit in the spore. And at one time, these are what thought as separate species of parasites. It wasn't until the more recent times that we realized that the mixed obelisk spore and these uh, 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 triectivum mixon spores uh, were the same. They infect the fish, which gets in there and feeding or gets into the fish. And cause a black tail and results in in problems on the spine, and it actually can kill fish uh, under stressful conditions. We found that low uh, infectivity of of uh, whirling disease in fish under drought condition can put uh, someone that's at a a uh, stressful condition that can result in mortalities. But the main thing is. Uh, Physical birds can spread this stuff around. So even if you have a hatchery uh, raceway, you might have some worms still hanging around. But concrete raceways have eliminated a lot of this problem by not having a, a environment for two thick worms to live in. Okay, here's one that you probably heard a lot of. White spot disease. Here, this is a ciliated Protozoan. It's a large one. It's one of the largest ciliated protozoans you can see. You actually uh, can actually really see this with the naked eye. Uh, it has a temperature range. Uh, we see this in the spring. It shows up uh, sometimes if you're stocking your fish into tanks or in your aquariums. It, it sometimes shows up about two weeks after stocking. So, you know, you got to be careful. Uh, when you bring new fish into your aquariums or into your place or farm, that uh, you're not bringing ick with you. Because once you get ick in a pond or a tank, uh, ponds are very difficult to control. Tanks are better for controlling this disease. But one thing that's good about, about ick, it's not serious, uh, is that once the temperature gets up in the 80s, this is disappeared. It's temperature sensitive range. It will reproduce at colder, colder temperatures, but a much lower rate. Here we go. This one, like, typically, if you do a gill smear, you will see a kind of C-shaped nucleus on there. This is a very characteristic of it. It's easily identified. Again, they live under the epidermis and causes all sorts of gill damage uh, to, to a fish. Uh, especially in large numbers. Again, uh, here we got a fish covered in egg. All the little white spots on there are actually, if you can, it's one of the few ones that you can actually visibly see. It looks like uh, uh, peppered with so large grains of salt. Again, to control this disease, you just crank up the temperature of the aquarium above 80, uh, salt sometimes, and Two to four parts per thousand of salts can help control this, and formalin treatments can control this disease. Okay, another uh, protozoan, another, again, we got protozoan diseases and protozoans, and a lot of times they live on fish and not a problem. Uh, we have a ciliated uh, protozoan called Trichodina. It's a kind of saucer shape. It has these little rings of, of uh, spines that are inward uh, shaped down there and very unique. 
and I call it, this is kind of the flea of the, of the fish world. Uh, if I went out to the river right now and pulled out some uh, centarkets or a bass, I should be able to find a couple of these. It's only when you get large numbers of these on the fish. Let me show another slide here. Oh, let me back up. Large numbers, you know, we go in there and take a, a, a gill clipping of the fish and we look at it on a microscope. We see hundreds of these things. I've got another picture later on on this. Uh, again, this is probably the most common uh, uh, protozoan parasite you can see. Uh, we have oxygen problems. You can find this on the skin. I've seen fish that have, were so heavily infested with uh, trichodite. The skin actually seems to be moving. There's so many of them. Uh, here we go. Now here's just a just a low power shot through the microscope with a fish that just totally loaded with uh, trichodina. This fish was having serious problems because uh, these trichodina gets on the gills, cause oxygen problems, and the fish suffer. And anytime you stress the fish, there's other kind of diseases that can come in and cause us issues like bacterial problems on a fish. Okay, uh, Amphiphyosiphidia. This is another protozoan we see on, on gills of fish. It's barrel shaped and they have what, a row of cilia at the top. And a lot of times we can see these in large numbers on fish. Uh, again, any kind of formal treatments usually can remove a lot of these uh, parasites from the fish. Okay, this is one of my more favorite ones. Uh, it's a septarian parasite. Uh, uh, changed the name. I still got Tricopter on. I like the name better Tricopter than the name they got for it. Anyway, these are cute. They look like almost little aliens when you look at them in, under the microscope. They got these little tentacles that reach out. And these are feeding tentacles. This is how they feed. And they get down into the gills. And the gills have these little troughs. And they get down in these troughs and they block water flow. And they cause some issues. The numbers of them can be very high. A lot of times you, they can be in the, on the fish, the tentacles so that you don't see it. They reproduce by budding, which they, part of the uh, organism buds off, and it's like a little silly, it goes attached somewhere else. Again, these are fairly cool parasites uh, that you can see on fish. And these are also uh, um, created by stress too. We, seen these uh, uh, after stalking catfish into cages, come back and we're monitoring for the cages for diseases and we see these guys on there. Uh, but these parasites can result in death of fish. Okay, uh, another, another disease that's real famous in the uh, catfish industry, uh, and this is caused by another protozoan parasite, very similar to the type of protozoan we talked about in the whirling disease, peripheral gill disease. Here is a section of gill showing the uh, cyst of the parasite in the gills, causing all sorts of inflammatory response, proliferation of uh, gill tissue. Here we have a picture of a gill that had fungus and, and all sorts of issues occurring on the cyst. It turns the uh, gills into mush, really. And sometimes it's called hamburger gill disease. Again, it's caused by a mixoporidium parasite, very similar to uh, one that's uh, in uh, trout. Here we have, uh, we can find cysts in catfish that has hundreds of these spores that infect the catfish. We go, again, the site life cycle is associated with some type of tuber fixed worm that causes the problems in the fish. Okay. And here's a really nice shot of a hammer. You can see it just looks mushy, uh, very mushy. And this is due to the parasite. This is an extreme uh, reaction to the parasites hit the fish. And we see this in a lot of uh, heavy uh, catfish production. You probably would not see this in aquarium or in your tanks. Again, another one is Ichthyobota, used to be called Cosset. This is a flagellated parasite. You can see little flagellums coming off. 
things attached to the gills of fish, and they can cause some serious problems. These are uh, serious uh, uh, disease, prosome disease of, of fish, uh, catfish, uh, bluegills, uh, tilapia, whatever. These are common on fish. It's a numbers game. You can see a live microscope shot. You see all these parasites on here. This is a section of a gill. You can see a lot of inflammation, a lot of proliferation of tissue. All these are parasites. All these are parasites. Attached to the gill, they use the flagella to attach to the gills, which cause a reaction and that causes problems for the fish. And again, formalin will take care of that. Again, this is, these are the kind of parasites you would see under poor environmental conditions. Remember, we go back to the fish health model where we see the pathogen, the environment, the host. Well, these guys are out there somewhere. And when you reduce the quality of your environment, poor water quality, high nitrites or ammonia, you will see these parasites popping up. Now, let's go to uh, not a, a uh, multicellular parasite, the monogenetic uh, trematodes, the flukes. And these are fairly common. These are a very diverse group and very interesting group. Uh, here we have Dryodaculus. This is a uh, typical motor gene. Uh, we have some anchors and there's some hooklets. We have these anchors and there's some hooklet. This is a hooklet, this is the anchors. Uh, in this case, we have a, a daughter uh, gyro. These are, uh, they're capable of having uh, live birth. These are oviviparous uh, organisms. Uh, and if you really look closely on the microscope, you see a daughter a gyro that's about ready to come out. But if you look in that one, go into the daughter one, there's also another one ready to go out too. So we can have, we've got three ready to go. Uh, these are very prolific. They get on gills. These anchors are grabbing onto the gill tissue, onto the skin, which allows uh, portals uh, for bacteria to enter the fish that can affect the fish. Uh, we can find, always find a, uh, a motor genetic trematode on a fish uh, that can cause some problems, but it's numbers game too. Just to show you uh, what I'm talking about when it comes to introduction of bacteria, there's a lot of information that we have out there that Jarodactylus on tilapia uh, can cause a portal for streptococcus infections that get into the tilapia. So these anchors are actually penetrating the epidermis that allows strep bacteria that enter the food to cause problems. Okay, uh, another one, Cleodiscus, the gill worms that we see these, you'll see these on the uh, on, where, on, on gills of fish, you see these on bluegill, bass, catfish, any fish that's out in the water. Again, you might see one or two on, on this, on a fish. Uh, again, you have anchors. You can see where they're attaching to the gills, and that's what causes the problem. They have the, the mouse here. We see four eye spots. They're always feeding around for tissue and stuff like that, bacteria. They're always moving around for, for, uh, for feeding, so the body's always moving around. But they're holding on because, uh, you know, water is passing through the gills. They don't want to be flushed away and floating out from the environment. And so they, these anchor devices keep them from uh, leaving the fish. Uh, we're going into uh, diagenetic trematode worms, flukes. In this case, we're going to have two different groups, pretty much. We're going to have what we call our larval. Uh, diagenetic trematodes, and we have adult uh, flukes that live in fish. And we'll just talk about the uh, larval diagenes first. Uh, you'll see these in all sorts of different things. We usually refer these to Metascaria. Uh, 
Uh, they form little cysts. You can find them in internal organs uh, and, and the eyes in various parts of the, of the fish, uh, in the muscle, skin, fins, and everywhere. And it usually requires a, a uh, fishing bird as the final host. Um, here we have uh, larval uh, dye genes in the eye of the fish. This can cause blindness in the fish. You can see right here, this is dye gene, dye gene, dye gene. All these are larval flukes that's in the eyes of the fish. Uh, again, uh, final host is usually in the bird. We got eggs. We always got some kind of snail that's involved in the life, life cycle that produces the free swimming sicari that gets into the fish and where it insists on the fish until a, a bird eats the fish so it can fill its life cycle. Uh, black grubs, you can see this on the skin. These are due to more larval uh, diegenes that you can find in fish. And if you open up the muscles, it's in the muscles. Uh, kingfish is usually involved in this black spot disease. Again, you were always, the pattern here is fish, some kind of snail, intermediate host fish, client definitive host bird. Here's a, this is a good one here. This was a flesh uh, fillet we took off of, of a fish. You can see all these little black spots now. Uh, these are usually don't do any harm to you. Uh, once you cook them, that takes care of the parasite. But that is not a, what you call, you may see this sometimes when you go out fishing and you pull a bluegill out or crappie, you might see something like this on the uh, muscles and on the skin of the fish. Again, you can just describe it or you can cook it. Here, here's a nice bluegill. You can see these nice little black spots on the fins of the fish where the larval dye gene has existed. That's a little, that's about a four inch uh, bluegill not ready to eat. But uh, again, snails in ponds cause these problems. And one way you can reduce the snail population in any pond, you reduce these larval uh, grubs uh, that gets on the fish is uh, uh, shell cracker red ears. You know, it's a type of centarchid. They tend to eat snails, small snails, and that can reduce the snail population, which will result in reducing the black spots that we see on these fish. Here's another one, famous one called yellow grub. And here we got a nice bass, open up the gill flap, the firkins, flap. you can see it all attached here. Now, What's interesting about yellow grub, uh, it's, it's, it's a, another larval dye gene. It needs another, it needs a fish eating bird. Uh, sometimes uh, these sometimes become inestensal parasites if eaten raw in humans. I think I got something on that at the end. Again, a uh, fish eating bird, some kind of snail. Sakari gets out, gets an intermediate fish, in this case we're talking about centarchids. So we have a, a life cycle. As long as you got birds coming in, they probably got some flukes and they're gonna release the eggs into the water, which results get into the snail that produces the infective stages that gets into the fish itself. So if we have a red ear, we can have red ears uh, munching on these, uh, on these snails to reduce the life of yellow grubbers with Penelstrum marginata. Okay, here we go. Another one that's real famous in, uh, in bluegills, another uh, species of Centarchid here, white grub. Uh, this picture right here is a picture of a liver from a, a fish loaded with white grubs. You never will see this in, in uh, most of the time when you're doing bluegills, but they are always there. Uh, many folks will typically not even see it because once you've got 
at bluegill, all this stuff goes out and you really not pay attention. But here we have a lever to kind of squish showing all the white grubs that was in that fish. And here we got another picture showing the cyst itself with the white grub in there from the fish that's off the liver here. So they are that you can find these on the kidney, intestinal tract, livers, uh, um, uh, on a fish. Again, where it's involved with a, a fish eating bird. Now I'm just not going to show you a whole lot here. There are adult digenes that lives in the intestine of the fish, and there's quite a few of them. I'm not going to go through them because they're usually uh, in a situation where they're in a sim more symbolic relationship and not doing any harm. But if you uh, open up intestinal systems of fish, you may find some adult digenes, and these do not involve a, a uh, fish, uh, fish eating bird. The adults lay the eggs, excrete through the intestinal systems of the fish, gets in the water, gets in the snail, and goes back into the fish. So this has a more direct life cycle versus the larval uh, digenes that we've seen uh, earlier. Now, some people really enjoy uh, phony head uh, worms or funny head worms. These are uh, chemicephalins. That we see in fish. Let's show a picture of one, uh, Neocyrhynchus. This is what we call phony herd worm. These have uh, male and female worms. They have hooks that they grab onto the intestinal tract and pull in and hold on to. In fact, they're found in the intestinal tract of fish. Let's see here. Here we got a intestine of the fish open up, and all these are phony head worms. Uh, there's many different species of them. So, you know, you can see that if I'm a fish, I have a lot of worms. You know, it is a wormy, truly a wormy life for a fish out there. Uh, again, just some drawings showing you different uh, sexes. You can see here the bosses here with the hooks. And there's just some drawings of the hooks. These hooks grab the intestinal lining of the fish. And the proboscis are retracted down into the worm, and so it allows it to remain attached to the intestinal tra tract and not get flushed out. Again, life cycle we have male and female. Here's a female, here's a male. This is the male, this is the testes. Here's female full of eggs. Eggs are released, and we get into some kind of ostacod, some kind of Some kind of ostacod, the worms get in there. Uh, we have an intermediate host, then it gets into the fish. So you can see a lot of these worms require some kind of intermediate host in order to fulfill its life cycle. But this ostacods tend to be some food for fish. Uh, again, just show you uh, this is another example of, uh, of uh, the life cycle. And it's showing a little bit more complexity. Not only can we go directly into the adult, sometimes we can go into another uh, peritonic host that's not the uh, definitive host, but it becomes a host that incesses the larval stages for the aphids until a fish eats it. So we can have some complexity in the life cycle. Remember, adult worms release eggs, some kind of amphipod or octocod takes it. It produces uh, cysts that gets eaten by the definitive host or by peritonic host, which is not the definitive host, but the cysts that goes into the fish and eaten. Okay, nematodes, uh, roundworms. Uh, there's tons of nematodes in the world. Everywhere you look, there's a nematode. Anywhere you go, there's a nematode. They're in sheep, they're in goats, they're in, they're in, in various spots, uh, various uh, soil, they're free living nematodes, they're parasitic nematodes, or plant nematodes. Uh, nematodes cover the world. Okay, uh, this is a, 
a really a nice one that we can find in, in our target population is a nematode called Camelanus. And what's interesting about uh, this one has this little mouth area that looks like a clamshell that attaches to the intestine of the fish. And it's sometimes called the anal blood worm. And these, these are found in other species of fish too. This is quite common, common this very species of these uh, particular parasites uh, in the intestine of fish. And morphology, the speciation is based on a lot of times what this uh, clam like uh, structure up here looks like. There we go. Here's an example of the anal area, all these worms hanging out are. Or anal bloodworm, and these are actually the females. So these are females. The males are usually impregnate the females. They disappear. They're usually very small. They release uh, the females grow to be large, protrude from the uh, anus. When they protrude from anus, they release the eggs into the water. Here's a, just another close-up showing showing what this looks like. Uh, and more more uh, indications of what these things are, and they're fairly big. They they hang up again. You see these in all sorts of different species, silvertails and other aquarium species of fish. You may have this in there. Uh, the life cycle of these uh, particular parasites. Uh, we get the adult in the in the uh, fish. The fish host. They release. Uh, eggs into the environment, some try crustacean gets it, they go through several stages uh, before it's eaten by the fish, and then it's eaten by the fish, they the adult is the adult, they have male and females, and the females, those are the ones that hang out of animals, release the eggs into the environment. Into the environment. Uh, you can find these type of worms, these uh, uh, blood worms anywhere, here the eye that has a nematode, living around the eye of the fish. Here's an example of a fisherman found one and he kind of uh, showed what it looks like. He caught a fish that has a, a nematode that hangs out of the eyes of the fish. And these are all female. This is a female, no males. Males are all gone. Males are quite tiny and when they first start out. When they first come out, the females and males are very small and the females mature to a large size that allows them to release the eggs into the water. Okay. The next group of, uh, of, uh, of parasites are the tapeworms, the cestodes. Um, and these are kind of interesting in itself because uh, there's quite a few different uh, tapeworms can be found in, in catfish and, and uh, bass and and other species of fish that, that are fairly interesting type of organisms. Okay, let's see. Ah, now one time we were doing some studies, and this is not the, the photograph, but uh, we were doing some studies uh, with catfish, and uh, we were doing some uh, checking the fish for bacteria and open up one, and most of the intestine tract had a lot of whiteness uh, to the inside of it. And when you open it up, I found a bunch of uh, tapeworms. Thorobotulin is a very typical uh, tapeworm that you see in catfish. And, so, and what's interesting is that you can go through a lot of different intestines and never see it. But then you come across one uh, fish uh, and you, then you open it up and it'd be hundreds of these guys in one fish because these tend to be over distributed. In other words, in a population, one or two fish may have the bulk of all these parasites while the rest of them have none or, or virtually one or two, but, you might, but typically you'll see a fish that has lots of these in a population. Uh, again, cestodes you can find uh, juvenile cestode stage in fish, you can find it in the muscle, various organs. Uh, we have one that uh, gets in the bluegills and bass, they call 
all sorts of problems with the tissue, causing some kind of cysts, and sometimes they can see and they rarely cause mortality. But having cystodes in a fish can reduce production uh, rates in fish, uh, but they're rare. We typically don't, they're typically ignored. But again, it's another one of these wormy life of a fish. Uh, again, you find adults and juveniles of uh, cestodes in a fish. Uh, here's another example of cestodes in a fish. Um, again, here we got the, a, a cestode that lives in a definitive host, attaches to the intestine. The little uh, progonids go off, they have eggs and everything in there, it's released. They have some kind of uh, Codapod that's in the water that ingests the the, the, uh, the eggs and goes for a cycle there, then gets into a, a uh, intermediate host where the uh, parasite there with the tapeworm insists and then it's eaten by these definitive hosts. Again, all these parasites tend to have a, a complexity to their life cycle. Okay, here's Here's one, Staphylobrothium, the broad tapeworm man. Now, this is an interesting one uh, that takes place because uh, if you eat raw fish, this, this uh, worm will infect you. So we have uh, human can be ingested and, and have some problems here. Again, we have eggs that get out there and go in the ground. You can see a, a fairly complex life cycle that's involved. Progonids release the eggs, the eggs get out there, a codopause are ingested by codopause, and codopause go into the fish. Okay, here's a, uh, this was a tapeworm, a couple of tapeworms that found in this fish. You can see it took up a lot of space. Uh, the broad tapeworm of, tape of uh, fish, you can see the little slit here, that's the scolex. So it's, this is a larval one right here. Okay, parasitic colopods. Uh, Lernia is, is probably a, a real famous one. We see anchor worms, as they call them, but there are several different stages that go through. Uh, the the six-stage colopods, sometimes you will see this attached to the gills. Uh, there, there are two sexes. We have males and females involved here. So the female is usually what we see. Uh, and you can see the anchors here, that's what attaches. Uh, egg sacs are usually hanging out. And here's an example of anchor worms on a, um, it might be a goldfish, koi goldfish probably. Anyway, you can see the inflammation around the anchor spot. This can lead to other kind of uh, bacterial diseases, inflammation. Portal entry for these uh, bacterial infections. This is a little egg sac right here. Here we got an example of egg sac. These eggs are released and they go through several different stages before uh, they get into uh, fish. Okay, other parasites we got argus, the gastus. These things are on the skin of the fish, feet, they got the box of feet. Again, these things have anchor on the gills. They can have anchor structures that are a little attached to the gill, hold on to it. Again, this is a female. You can see that egg sacs. Uh, one of the things that become an issue now with uh, trout is uh, gill lice, Salicola. There's two different species. Both species are found in the river systems. You can see the little anchor spot right here. Yeah, this is the anchor attachment. But you notice these are all females. The, again, the males are much smaller and they impregnate the females. And what we see is just females here. The gill is just totally loaded. You can find it in the mouths of the fish and on the gills. And the trouble is you don't want to have fish just like this come into your place because then you can have an infestation of your different uh, type of uh, crustacean. 
uh, protopod type or kind of crustacean uh, of gill life similar situation to protopod. Here we got some. Now, I would not want to be this fish. You can see these uh, crustaceans are attached to them, they're sucking out. And these uh, trouble with these things is they can actually infect fish with viral uh, problems. We've had some issues with uh, sea lice on some monads produce uh, infected them with a, a uh, virus that causes anemia. So again, uh, I would not want to have one of these fish on there because you know they get it hurts the production. It hurts the uh, uh, the fish itself and cause some deaths for the fish because basically they're getting the life sucked out of them because uh, these organisms are feeding on the fish itself. Zoonotic problems. We do have some zoonotic uh, situations with parasites from fish. Uh, there is a uh, nematode that you can find in marine species. Uh, again, this is wormy fish. Uh, it's a nematode and a sexus. Uh, can get into uh, fish. Uh, the fish is actually an intermediate host. And it's actually the definitive host are found in seals and, and uh, dolphins, uh, usually. But we can also end up um, in humans too, if you eat some raw meat, most uh, seafood fillets that are processed are cabled for these nematodes. Let's see, we've got here we go. Here's an example of muscle with these nematodes in there, and these things are cabled to look for it. Here's a bunch of worms from the intestine of the fish. You can see that these things. If you do not cook these or eat this raw, you can get infected with the nematode very severely and cause gastroenteritis, which you do not want. In fact, a lot of these contracecum type worms, these uh, ground worms, can cause gastroenteritis and uh, it causes some issues. And sometimes you have to uh, get some uh, medicine from the doctor to uh, flush these guys out. Okay, uh, clinostrum, I talked about the yellow grub earlier. Uh, accidental host, we can be accidental host. Sometimes I get questions from uh, physicians about this. Uh, again, yellow grub, you can see on the gills and fins and all that, and on the muscles. If you took a fish and ate that, and you did not kill these parasites, you, you can actually uh, end up uh, having these attached, but they're since they're in the wrong host, a lot of times they will flush out or die out. Again, you know, fishing birds always involved. Uh, one thing that we used to do a long time ago is to try to mimic the dependent host's use of uh, day old chicks. We used to feed day old chicks these larval uh, dye genes, and then we would uh, check them several days later to see if the uh, parasite developed into adult. Uh, again, uh, we have liver flukes that's real common in uh, Africa and Asia. Again, uh, they can get into fish, consist in fish, and this carries can infect the fish. Again, since it's a, a digene, there is a, a, a snail host involved. You try to break the life cycles by usually trying to get rid of the snail. So if you eat the fish, you can end up with liver flukes that get in your intestinal tract and cause all sorts of, of problems in adults. Okay. So next time you open, look at a fish, you might get a surprise. You might see something looking at you when you open up, a, open up one of these things. Okay. We do have a fish health lab. We do look for parasites in fish. Um, that's what uh, my specific uh, training was, was in parasites, but that's been uh, broad my uh, scope of expertise over the years. Okay, fish health. Unfortunately, 
you know, let's say I do a lot more stuff than I laugh. My wife, I've actually done catfish uh, spawning and reproduction and hatchery work. Again, that's the end uh, of my talk.